morning, good afternoon to our webinar attendees around the world. Uh, my name is Jeff Barrett. I have the good fortune of leading the RDCA DAP uh, development effort on behalf of the Critical Path Institute. As you all probably realize, the platform was officially launched just a month ago, and we're excited to kick off this first webinar as real evidence that uh, we're indeed uh, ex extending our outreach to partners globally and looking for strong collaboration with uh, expertise really around the world and our relationship with Clinarion, we have an MOU in place for some time now. This is a key partner for us in a strategic alliance that we're expecting to bear fruit for the entire rare disease ecosystem. That being said, I will introduce now my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Alexandra Bertorn, who will uh, introduce the webinar. Alex, take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, welcome to the RDC ADAP uh, 6 webinar of this year. Uh, I'm Alex Batoon, Scientific Director for the RDC ADAP, and uh, today we're really uh, excited to have Douglas Drake, Senior Director, Client Solutions from Clinarian, to speak with us and present an existing uh, rare disease use case showcasing Clinarian predictive modeling efforts. And then we will discuss our collaboration with Douglas and his team and with RDC ADAP. We leverage data from both platforms and uh, in try to improve how we can generalize some of the models Doug, uh, Douglas will present. Um, to start, we have a few housekeeping announcements. This is a recorded webinar and it will be available for future viewing. Please stay muted throughout the webinar so that we don't hear uh, your cell phone beeping. Um, then during this webinar, you can uh, enter your question in the Q&A chat box on the right side of your screen. Be sure to address your questions to all panelists uh, instead of sending your question to individuals, so uh, we make sure we capture all your questions and comments. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity for us to bring these questions to Douglas and Jeff, and we will address we will address them. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have uh, another webinar coming up after this one. It will be the final webinar of 2021 for for us at RDC ADAP, held on November 10th with uh, CPAF Associate Di Director of Data Science, Dr. Romano Walls, and she will describe how they see data management practices and the use of ontologies that she is developing for the platform. And we will emphasize how the data ingestion and curation process is uh, developed to increase the value of patient data within our platform. So stay tuned uh, for more information on that upcoming webinar. With that said, uh, Douglas, you can take it away. Team at CPATH, merci Fimal. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and give you a brief introduction to Clinarian and some of our work. As mentioned, we're very excited to be part of this partnership and very, very focused on uh, enriching and enabling uh, treatments toward rare diseases. Rare disease patients, as many of you know, uh, is a large sector with a large diversity of different diseases. Many of these patients are never fully treated in their lifetimes. And it's a social burden, not just to the patient, but also their families and caregivers. So we are very focused on really enabling us to help find these patients and treat them effectively. Next slide. I'd like to give you a brief introduction to Clinarian. We're based in Basel, Switzerland, um, and we're actually been in this business for a number of years for focused on really working with hospital information system, EMR data, and really leveraging real-time, real, -time, real uh, world, world data in a clinical and real world setting. We work with a number of CROs as well as pharma, as well as also hospitals. And our goal is to really accelerate clinical development, clinical research by enabling the hospital to work with their patients more effectively using their EMR data. So we really try to democratize the data and really using it effectively for not just reimbursement, but also healthcare itself. Next slide. We have a global network, and I want to explore this with you a little bit, um, and a lot of uh, countries that really also have a focus in rare disease. As you'll see here, we have uh, currently online 36.2 million patients. Uh, we're growing exponentially with a lot of expansion into very needy areas of the world. Uh, but, but our current network, as you'll see, is predominantly in Turkey and Brazil, also in Eastern Europe, we're also here in Switzerland. Uh, and growing also then into um, the Saudi Arabia, 
into Taiwan, uh, Korea, and then also further into the United, United States, but also further in South America, including Colombia, Argentina, Uruguay, um, but even further into uh, Europe, including Spain, as you see here, Greece, um, and elsewhere, uh, including Germany and France. So we're very excited to really enable and work with hospitals in partnership to help them better use the EMR data to stratify their own patient care and in turn be able to work with their data in an anonymous and a safe fashion so that we can obviously see patients that need care and obviously be able to follow those patients during their journey in the healthcare system. Next slide, please. EMR data, and many of you may be aware of this, but I want to just highlight this, was originally designed for reimbursement care. It's the electronic data that's done or captured at the time when patients are treated. Um, and it's usually the coded information that's used for reimbursement. And so we capture all the information in the what's called the digital record within the hospital. This includes the patient demographics, medications, procedures, diagnosis, laboratory results, but more importantly, we're capturing these over time. So we really have the ability to look at the patient journey in an effective fashion. And but doing this over the number of countries that we're working over, you'll see that we're doing this in a lot of different types of coding methodologies, different languages, different ontologies. And what's unique about Clinarian is that we actually do this uh, simultaneously across almost 20 different countries in many different languages and can real time bring this data up into a single ontology that we can then query through a cloud-based connectivity to each hospital. This allows us to see the data real time. And we get nightly updates of all their, of their data and can see this um, anonymously be identified, uh, removing all patient uh, and personal information so that we can really look at these patient types um, in a safe fashion and in a GDPR and, and data secure fashion. Next slide, please. Our technology is unique and it's patented, but the really important aspect of this is really the patient themselves and being able to use this data in an effective fashion toward real world data in real world data evidence toward real world evidence. And I give you a couple of examples here how clinical EMR data can be real world data and how it can be used for evidence. Uh, and I'll focus uh, later specifically on rare disease, but I want to also show you how this can be used for predictive modeling. We're looking at therapeutic insights and treatment, looking at obviously healthcare market, but in more specifically, really being able to look at how compounds are being used effectively obviously looking at demographic treatments and other algorithm, algorithms. And by doing this in this top right corner, you can see that we can look at incidents and be able to see uh, treatment methodologies over time. So the longitudinal aspect of the data is also very, very important to be able to effectively see that patient, be able to see the diagnosis, and then be able to see treatment and all the conditions over time. Next slide, please. Got a little pause, so I apologize. Can I have the next slide, please? Can I have the next slide, please? We seem to have a little bit of a hiccup, but let me just take an opportunity to talk about our network and how this obviously can connect. Um, and one of the things that we're working on in the case of rare disease, and you'll see this uh, as part of a discussion, is looking at phenotype. And phenotype, I mean, actually looking at the conditions of the patients. And in many cases, because rare diseases have very heterogeneous presentations, one of the important aspects is being able to look at the phenotype of these patients, being able to look at the different combinations of the traits of the disease, and that way be able to look at patients that have never been correctly diagnosed and potentially diagnose them. Um, so this is one of the things that we can do through our network is effectively be able to look at patients over their time, over their treatment journey, um, and then look for these different types of phenotypes um, and also combinations of phenotypes to really see whether these patients might be potential rare disease patients that have never been correctly diagnosed. This becomes really, really instrumental many times uh, for patients that have obviously 
never been correctly diagnosed. And I have an example here. Uh, we're just going through back through a couple of slides, but we'll get back on track here in a second. But the idea of this is that by looking at these, we can look at patients that over time have never been correctly di diagnosed and obviously have a heterogeneous uh, presentation and use this from a standpoint of really modeling to hopefully find these patients that have never been correctly diagnosed. This is a, a poster that we presented earlier this year at the Rady Children's uh, Rare Disease Frontiers of Pediatric Medicine in San Diego. And I did this in combination with Christopher Rudolph of Evolve Global. One of the ideas here, and what you'll see with rare disease is increasingly the idea of uh, whole body sequencing to find patients very, very quickly um, in a neonatal setting, especially newborns, to give as quickly as possible an early diagnosis of potential rare disease and really look at possible outcomes. But this works well in hospital settings, but for many patients that are older or have not been diagnosed as newborns, um, the idea is really now, how are you going to go back and find these patients and get them correctly diagnosed retrospectively? And this is oftentimes very, very hard. And so there's generations of people, patients that have rare disease, many times uh, a significant portion of their lifetime that have never been diagnosed. So this idea of phenotypic modeling by looking at the symptoms of the disease and looking at the various combinations of this gives you the idea of how we can potentially look for patients and look at their symptoms, seeing that they're not responding to traditional treatments and therefore then elect them to be uh, tested diagnostically to see if they are a rare disease patient and then work with the hospital to have that testing done. And then if correct, put them on the correct medication for the first time. So this idea of phenotypic modeling is something that we can do through EMR data because we have a whole patient journey. And because we can see, for example, and I'll give you a couple examples here of Fabry and Gaucher disease, as well as Pompe and NPS1, what we can do here, and I'll give the example of uh, Fabry, which you know is a lysosomal dis, uh, storage disorder. Uh, so these, uh, this is a metabolic disorder, um, and it has effects on the cardiovascular system, on the kidney function. Also, it also causes a lot of peripheral pain. But because of these diverse symptoms and also them being different, obviously, uh, organ effects, many times doctors don't correctly diagnose it. There's also some situations of late onset of the disease, uh, which also complicates diagnosis. But so by looking at the combination of these possible uh, symptoms and developing then uh, phenotype maps, we can then look for patients that have these best different combinations through the MR data then working with the hospital through a uh, study, uh, possibly bringing these patients in for diagnostic testing and then obviously confirming that diagnosis. And so we've done this now successfully and I'll give you a couple of examples here, both from Turkey and in also the UAE in the Middle East, where we've done this to identify patients and that way be able to enrich for these patients that uh, have never had treatment and get them on the correct medication. So this was a poster we did focusing on Fabry and Gaucher and MPS1, where we can show uh, on the right-hand panel, the mechanism of obviously using that phenotype my map to look for these patients and search for them and then bring them back in. And this can be also used in a more advanced AI model, uh, artificial intelligence to really use this also in a learning fashion to develop these models um, in an enriched fashion to then apply across the whole population in, in a country or in, a, in hospital settings to really then find all these potential patients up to 90% of those that have been correctly diagnosed. So this can be a very, very uh, effective methodology for helping find these patients and treat them. And the next couple of slides will talk about how we're doing this mechanistically, both in Turkey and in the UAE working through the hospitals through ethical committee approval on these studies to do the outreach and then the enrichment. Next slide, please. This is the example using, um, uh, once again, using our network for the being able to, as I said, using the existing EMR data can, to actually stratify these patients and then by playing and using sponsor-based disease symptoms in the HR, we can then look for these patients and identify them 
then with the sponsor, you set up an ethical study to have these patients brought in and genetically tested and then uh, hopefully diagnosed correctly. So this is just some graphics here. These will be shared afterwards. And I want to just go through how this is done in the next slide uh, and how this is being done specifically over a time frame. Next slide, please. So using these models, these phenotypic models, we can now do this and using this as an exact and adapted cohort model. And this I call is really that phenotypic model. We can develop the inclusion exclusion parameters based upon uh, patient symptoms. This can be done over the matter of two to four weeks. And because we can readily see the patients and search this through the uh, Clinarian PNX, the patient network, and by connecting directly to the hospital EMR real time, we can iteratively develop these models and do searches and iterate these very, very quickly with sponsors, as well as also the hospital for clinical research. Then we can actually develop that study to do the protocol, um, do the re required submissions to the site for the clinical outreach. And then uh, depending upon the, the trial itself uh, or study taking two or three months, depending upon that for the ethical committee approval and schedule, and also Ministry of Health approval many times in some countries. After that, then we can implement the study and then go into the actual direct patient outreach and diagnostic testing. So what I'm showing here is within a matter of uh, six to eight months, uh, we can readily start this and very quickly then effectively find patients and hopefully get them correctly diagnosed and on the correct medication. So this becomes very, very life altering for patients that have never had treatment is this ability to now use the EMR within the hospital as a phenotypic modeling and outreach mechanism to find these patients and finally diagnose them correctly. Next slide, please. This next slide is the, the work that we're doing in the Cleveland Clinic in the Ayu Dhabi, um, where we're also doing the same thing, but for, for uh, Fabry disease. Once again, the time frames are very similar, but you know, looking at these complexities, just in building the models, these can be done iteratively to really refine these in that way, then um, doing the outreach once again, two to three months, and then another couple of months to outreach to the patients. We're starting this now in UAE also for this particular study to do the outreach directly to the patients. And we'll hopefully then have results that we can publish early spring next year. Next slide, please. So with that, what I'd like to do is acknowledge and thank Jeff for inviting us uh, to participate in this. Also, my our sponsors and partners, both in Sanofi, Turkey, and in UAE, and also working with Christopher Rudolph Evolve on some of the AI modeling and outreach with that. The idea of this and what I'd like to summarize with is this idea of really being able to use the digital record within the hospital as a phenotypic modeling tool can be now be used to really help better diagnose and better find patients and get especially rare disease patients finally on the correct treatment. I thank you for attention and I turn this back over to Alexander. Thanks, Nicholas. I, I believe Jeff, um... You wanted to uh, open the conversation to the potential of collaboration that we uh, just started discussing with Douglas. I think we're really excited by this collaboration. Uh, we feel there are a lot of opportunities there. So if you want to start by describing what are your thoughts and um... I can I can give some uh, some feedback. Uh, it's important that we have tangible evidence of this collaboration. I think. You know, these webinars are fantastic for creating the expectation, but uh, we as a community are very committed to have these two platforms connect to each other to share data and also to share models. So one of the tangible next steps is for us to consider what would registry data look like in the Clinarion system. So we're taking steps, we're going to identify meaningful data and then provide it to Clinarion and, and then see how that visualization looks like in their in their platform. And then we'll do the reverse. So I think the both organizations recognize the need to work together. This is something we talked about during the launch is uh, the ability to 
build APIs and other means of connecting the environments, but also to, to share data and the tools and the knowledge around the rare disease community. We, we clearly can't do this by ourselves in, in either, uh, for either organization. So leveraging the community here is, uh, is the right thing to do. And uh, Onarian's an excellent partner in this regard. They've had a long history in rare diseases, as you've seen, and they built a phenomenal platform that uh, allows us to take advantage of that expertise. Doug, did you wanna expand any more on that? I, yeah, I think one of the things that we're really trying to do as part of this hospital network that we're building is creating these connectivities and expertise. Um, a lot of the challenges with rare disease is that they're obviously not commonly seen and commonly diagnosed. Um, and so there's, you know, a real also need to increase the knowledge bandwidth within these. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do as part of our network is obviously create um, more connectivity, more understanding of what we can do with the AMR data. So there's more knowledge and more accessibility toward, you know, using this as diagnostic tools. Um, one of our things also within our network is working with other networks, such as CPATH, so that, that expands that network and expands the capabilities. We obviously can work with EMR data and claims data, but one of the real important things is really not just the connectivity, you know, that connectivity between the different data sources also then allows us to enrich and better model these patients and better find them. Um, so we're very excited about being able to connect um, our system to the CPAT system, be able to work, you know, cohesively across different data types and be able to use this to enrich this patient uh, enablement and use this also as a really better diagnostic tool. Um, that's, that's the key point is that because many times these patients are, you have different presentations, you have different conditions, you have different complications you really need to look at all those different combinations of factors, which means that you really need to look at um, across a large amount of data and a large number of, of patient population communities. So enriching this community between the PNX and CPATH is really uh, very critical to actually then enabling this, you know, more broadly across, you know, not uh, just more patients, but also really better uh, diagnostic capability. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, one of the exciting things with our collaboration is the ability to take a look at a broader pooled patient population. And then we can ask more specific questions about the generalizability of what we find when we take a look at the breadth of the uh, rare disease populations that we can pull into a, a common use case. So I think there's these are exciting times from the standpoint of real data sharing, but but also taking a look at the tools that we're building. If adjustments need to be made because we're considering a, uh, a rare disease population in another part of the world, then this can be accomplished. No one has declared victory on any of these tools. We clearly, yeah. as a community, look at this as a work in progress. And I, I fully agree. And I think that's one of the things is, you know, by, you know, because we're looking at really, in many cases, needles in a haystack. Now, a lot of the treatment methodologies and the standards of care are also important in actually building these models effectively. And that means, you know, being able to look at these, be able to understand how this is being done, for example, in the United States and uh, other countries, but then applying that into other uh, populations where rare disease is even harder and maybe not as readily um, diagnosed easily and being able to apply that learning more broadly. And that way, really leveraging that community of knowledge. Well, and the other interesting aspect is you're already working with pharmaceutical sponsors to facilitate drug development on their side. So I think this creates a real opportunity to leverage what you've already done by additional data stores that we would have available as part of the uh, the whole rare disease ecosystem with other data sources. So it can only get better from that standpoint. I, I totally agree with you because I think that once we have these kind of phenotypic models and even AI capabilities, and you've developed these, maybe, you know, what we've, for example, done, these could then be readily applied across other populations into CPATH um, to really then create a better outreach and a better effectivity. Uh, Douglas, just uh, bouncing back on you mentioning AI, 
have a question coming from uh, the audience on uh, the type of AI models that we're using the, in the work uh, you presented. Could, could you uh, get into more complex details uh, about these models? So, you know, AI is, an ish, is a very, very exciting uh, technology. It's obviously, you know, been around for a long while, but now that we have access to a lot more data, there's a lot more uh, capabilities. Once again, it's about, um, in our case, we're looking at the phenotypic response or phenotypic conditions in those patients. Um, we don't necessarily readily have genetic information as part of the EMR. Um, genetic detail is obviously kind of the confirmatory diagnosis of maintenance for rare disease. But we don't times, many times have that as part of the EMR because these patients have never been correctly diagnosed or correctly tested. Um, so we're really looking at the phenotypic outcome of the genetic uh, expression and really looking at what's happening within those patients expressing. And then hopefully we can get them into genetic testing to see. So a lot of this um, from the standpoint of AI is looking at the different conditions. As I mentioned, for example, Fabry, looking at the effects on cardiovascular, looking at effects on, uh, for example, kidney function, looking at obviously pain and joint issues, looking at those all in combination. Um, because many times in a healthcare setting, we get focused as healthcare professionals on one symptom and relate that to maybe, you know, a disease, for example, cardiovascular being obviously a, a cardiovascular disease or a kidney issue being obviously just strictly a kidney disease where, you know, many of these rare diseases basically being metabolic disorders can affect many um, organ systems together. And so you have to look at these together in combination and that model that becomes the AI is really looking and weighting those different phenotypes and the different phenotypic combinations and an effect then looking at how those possibly could combine and how this might be expressed maybe in one patient slightly different than another, but really covering all those different possible phenotypic combinations. And, and just continuing on, on, on the, the question of how you, you actually um, develop that model for Fabry, uh, how many patients do you need uh, already, already to, to actually be able to uh, develop a basic phenotypic, phenotypic model? So it, it is a very iterative process. We're working with clinical research uh, information to understand some of these different uh, combinations or phenotypic uh, expressions. Um, and it's, it's basically an iterative process with the clinic because, you know, the confirmatory is once again, you know, we're looking at these patients, hopefully then flagging them, then going back, um, having those diagnostically tested and then confirming whether they're correct or not. And that weighting then adds to then the, you know, the model itself and the model effectiveness. So it does become a iterative process. Um, and each time that you do that, there is obviously a refinement. Um, so this can take several iterations. And once you also apply this into different countries with the different healthcare or treatment methodologies, you need to relearn that model a little bit to understand how the, this coding or this symptom is obviously being coded within that healthcare system. Um, and so that's where, you know, the, ex the expansive data becomes very important, the coverage of the data, um, but also understanding the methods or treatments and the standard of care in the healthcare system within that country. Um, and this is one of the things that we are very expert in trying to do this now across almost 20 different countries is being able to apply these across a wide um, network and being able to do these simultaneously. And our, we're really excited because I think a lot of this learning then from where we are can then be very helpful to, you know, finding also these same kind of ethnic discrete populations and, and patients also in U.S. and Western Europe populations. Yeah, thank you. And, and Douglas, the team speaks a lot of languages. Uh, you speak a lot of languages. But, but what about the data languages? Uh, how do you handle the different standards that you potentially face in terms of data standards and, and you know, the different technical platforms that you connect uh, with around the world? 
So we work with any type of um, EMR. We have to have some type of uh, a digital EMR system uh, in place. And when we first are working with our hospitals, we do an audit of their data to understand, you know, how the composition and what data they have there. We combine this in and it goes into an ontology. One of the things that's unique about Clinarian is we keep the local ontology, the local coding, in addition to then going into our uh, ontology so that we can then query across all these countries at the same time. But then we have those same, they keep those mappings. And this is important because then as codings shift or as new diagnosis or new medications come on, we can then recode those without having to recollect the data. Um, but we're Swiss and I, t I t tend to tell people we're a little bit like uh, a Swiss knife and that we work with any type of data standard, uh, whether it be OMOP, we're actually an OMOP certified uh, vendor, um, any, any of the other you know data standards we also work with. So the data standards themselves, much like languages, have different advantages, but never is one exactly perfect, but you really do need to have almost like a UN, a little bit of a simultaneous translation across those different languages to obviously then get the meaning across these different countries in different contexts together. And, and in terms of um, uh, getting away from, from the data aspect, but, but what about regulation and privacy of patients? How does Clanarian handle this complex navigation of, of privacy and international laws? So this is extremely critical. Um, we're obviously in Europe, we're very much so GDPR focused. So one of the things that we're very focused on is uh, data privacy and, and data security, and especially obviously private uh, patient privacy detail. So one of the aspects of what we're doing is by querying, that we keep the data within the hospital at all times. So what we do is when we build a relationship with the hospital, we build essentially within the hospital an anonymized version of their EMR, and that's what we can query from the outside. And so we're never bringing that data out. We're actually querying it inside. And so for that way, I can see, you know, the various patients and I do cohort in inclusion and exclusion without bringing that data out. That's what I can do through the cloud connectivity I have to that anonymized instance. So the real advantage of what we're doing is we're not bringing that data out. So we maintain the data locally. And all I'm really doing is then bringing, you know, learning from that model and then the hospital themselves, they can also then use that model internally to then re-identify those patients and do the outreach for the clinical research and also then diagnostic uh, testing. So the advantage of our system is that we're enabling, number one, the ability to see this data outside without bringing it out. The hospital then can you, um, run this. They have, we have what's called a patient finder inside the hospital that allows them to see their own EMR data and use this for own, their own patient care. So when we, for example, run a query on my nominized side, they can then run that query against their instance, be able to see those patients directly and then use this for their own treatment methodologies and outreach. And this becomes a very critical two-step to enabling the patient care while also maintaining the data security and privacy uh, for those patients and the patient data globally. Thanks. Um, so we, we talked a lot, a lot about patient findings and um, as you know, it, it, I think we're excited about, about that aspect. Definitely, uh, I'm talking to a lot of communities and um, and really some 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 registries scouting patients to increase mm -hmm. the pool because we don't have a lot of patients in their space. So that that's 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 very interesting. But Jeff, I was wondering what other potential there is in terms of collaboration between RDC ADAP and Clinarian. I think we have all, all, a lot of other ideas and uh, I just wanted you to, to uh, touch, yeah, definitely touch a little on that. Yeah, definitely. Great, great topic, Alex. I mean, I think one of the things I personally am excited about is to work with the Clinarian uh, analytics team on building models that have never been built before. They've got a lot of expertise and we can take a look at different communities where there's gaps in information where we can really move the needle uh, if we have reasonable data to start with. And uh, some of the questions in the chat are so really good because they're talking about what happens if you have more than one model. I mean, frankly, we would love to be in that situation. 
Sure. But there are approaches to consider ensemble models or model averaging if that becomes an issue. But again, I think one of the things that CPAT and Clinaria together bring to the table is the analytics expertise, but also the ability to draw in regulatory authorities to help us give context of use feedback and to build to build models that are high fidelity and that can be trusted. I think Clinarian's done a great job of this mm -hmm. so far. They're clearly developing tools that are being used right now for predictive purposes. And our, our goal would be to expand that suite of tools and make them available for a, a broader use of patient populations. And there's plenty of situations where these rare diseases are related so that you can leverage the information defined in one rare disease to another. And that again is a new frontier for our collaboration. Yeah. Did you want to expand on that? I think that one of the things that we're really working toward is this idea of working directly with the hospitals without having to move the data out. But the idea of that is it also maintains, we're always working with the most recent data within the hospital. And what we're doing is bringing the learnings out. And this is one of the things also we have a strategy toward um, federated learning where we can take and you know use the hub and spoke model in the cloud that we have to be able to you know work with different models across different sites and take those learnings from that. So the important aspect of this is not you know necessarily having to collect the data and pull that out. And I think that's an important point, but really being able to take that learning uh, and be able to learn and be able to use this as a uh, methodology to find and better diagnose patients, whether regardless of the disease, and be able to follow those patients and their journey in situ, also regardless of the disease. Um, these, this type of connectivity, I think, is going to be where we're going to go, um, especially in GDPR and where we have to be very, very protective about patient privacy. Um, but this also then allows us to then connect to uh, instances such as CPATH and apply models without obviously having to then pull the data out into a, a common collection. And so this is something that I think is really important to talk about because uh, you know previously with AI, I think there's been a lot of discussions about creating large data lakes and large data aggregations, which you really just can't do across all these different countries and into rare disease populations. So this idea of this you working in a hub and spoke fashion and working with the data in situ becomes a really how we need to apply and then be able to obviously be able to look at, for example, you know, apply the model that we have, for example, developed maybe in Turkey and, and in UAE to patient populations that CPAP have um, in other in other countries and other, you know, from other institutions, or even connecting it to other hospital network connections. So the idea is let's work with the data where it is in situ and take that learning and then be able to apply it elsewhere. And I think that becomes really where we need to go in terms of this type of analytics and really applying these technologies in a, in a federated fashion. Well, one of the other things, Doug, that really falls off of your statement is the ability to generate credible synthetic data from these types of sources so that they can be the inputs for clinical trial simulation tools and really mm -hmm. give sponsors a leg up and patient selection, the design of appropriate clinical trials, endpoint selection. So I think building the framework by which that can be done in a seamless and expeditious manner just helps the whole community as well. Exactly. And that's what our goal is, because if you do that, like, as I mentioned, with our relationship, the hospital can readily re-identify those patients. So it can be readily used as a diagnostic, but it can also be used then for clinical research and clinical trial outreach and recruitment. And so that connectivity back to the direct patient and the patient care is really part of our key yeah. focus. I think that's the real exciting part of this collaboration is that we're moving in both directions to do work together that helps patients now, as well as helps pharmaceutical sponsors develop and accelerate cures for the future. So mm -hmm. it really is a good example of operating expeditiously, expeditiously in both directions. I, I'm honestly very, very excited because I think this hub and spoke and being able to work through nodes and being able to connect, you know, directly to CPATH and be able to, you know, apply this, you know, these technologies and be able to connect these different, you know, not just connecting 
you know, using these models to really be able to look across different types of data and be able to use this learning as a learning tool is really how we can better, you know, really democratize this data and really apply it toward uh, a, a population in many cases rare disease that's been largely underserved and under overlooked. Yeah. Doug, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of frontier geographic areas where Clinarian is seeking to further expand its outreach. Yes, so that's, um, we're very much so, uh, as I mentioned in our my first slide, or in our map, we have concentrations in South America, in Europe. We're obviously based in Switzerland. Um, we're growing in uh, the in Eastern Europe, but we're also expanding into Europe. Uh, we'll be adding Spain, um, but we're really excited to be expanding into Saudi Arabia and adding a number of institutions there. Um, in addition, we're also looking at sites in Africa. Uh, and further sites also in South America, including uh, not just Brazil, but also Colombia, um, Uruguay, and uh, Argentina. So we actually have um, been able to grow our network very effectively. Um, and, you know, we're really excited about this partnership and also other partnerships to also um, enable access to U.S. data. It's exciting times. I, I think, uh, you know, one of the intentions with uh, the pla RDC ADAPT platform is to expand the functionality and the outreach in parallel. So this is a great start. I'm looking forward to being able to come back to this webinar series and and uh, show within uh, hopefully a short time frame the progress we've made. Yeah. This is a good start. Yeah, I think this is, I, I really am excited because it, I think there's a number of underserved populations, even in large countries that um, I think we're, you, by using the hospital digital record that we can really now better enable care toward. So, yeah, I think we very, we very much are excited about this opportunity. I think that the, the synergies between the platforms and the connectivity will allow us to really be able to share insights, share models. Um, and really what I'm excited about is not just the network, but also then the participation of healthcare providers, doctors, um, and rare, rare disease physicians because uh, now from this network, they are not just looking locally at their own populations, but they can look at obviously populations on the other side of the world and other parts of the network and see how these uh, models can be used effectively. And I think that's that's one of the key aspects is in uh, really using this as a wider network, not just uh, you know to outreach to the patients, but also for the caregivers themselves. Um, because I think this is part of that constant learning in constant iteration is using is learning in, in a wider spectrum. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm not seeing any uh, further questions coming in uh, from the chat box. So um, maybe we can give final remarks. Sounds good. No, I uh, Again, on behalf of the uh, RDC ADAPT team and the Critical Path Institute, uh, I would definitely like to thank our colleagues at Clinarian for sharing this uh, exciting progress that they've made. We're looking forward to next steps. And uh, just as a, a note to the whole community, this is something we plan to do in a very open and transparent manner. Both organizations recognize the need to share this information as we're developing it. So this is something that will be done in a very collaborative manner and shared with the whole ecosystem. So we invite you to ask questions uh, now or later at any time on our progress. We plan to make tangible next steps so that this becomes more than just an opportunity. And I'd like to also extend the invitation. If the people have models, um, you know, that they'd like to obviously try and test, um, we have a platform that allows us to quickly code these up, do inclusion exclusions, and really be able to show you, you know, how these type of cohorts and where the patients are that match. And so that that iterative uh, learning, I think, is something that we can very quickly take advantage of. And I'd like to show that to you. Um, so I extend the invite um, to anyone to, in, in working with CPATH also to really be able to take this so that we can start 
uh, learning how these type of phenotypic models can be effective toward identifying different patient populations, cohort inclusions, and really refining that cohort that really is the rare disease patient that you know we're trying to create a better um, standard of care for. Well, thank you, um, Douglas. Thank you, Jeff. Um, again, uh, we're very excited by this collaboration. So stay stay tuned for more. Um, and then uh, to end this webinar today, I want to remind you again that our next uh, webinar will be held November 10th uh, with Dr. Roman Walls, uh, our Associate Director of Data Science at our uh, Data Collaboration Center. Uh, our webinar will uh, describe the RDC adapt data management practices and the use of ontologies with emphasis on how the data ingestion and the curation processes increase the, the value of the patient's data we have been collected, collecting at the RDC adapt. So November 10th, uh, our final webinar of the year. Um, thanks everybody for attending our webinar today. Merci. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Doug. Au revoir.